One of the most familiar, one of the most familiar verses in the entire Bible is one that I bet this young lady right here could even recite. Can you say it? Can you recite it? No. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. You know it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know that. It is called the Gospel in a Miniature. In other words, you get the entire Gospel in, in just a, one sentence. It's an awesome verse. And if you'll look, there were those who, there were those who had football players who put John 3.16 in that blackout, you know. And yeah, I, I, I'm kind of hokey, but I wonder how many people who had no idea what John 3.16 was looked it up, Googled it, and said, what? Let's read it together. It, no, that's got to work. I just went over it. <laughs> No, I refuse to accept that. How are they going to know the verse if they don't see it up there? <laughs> Fortunately, we do. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you had trouble on your bulletin there, the section for the kids, if you had trouble, we just gave you all the answers. So what's the setting for this verse? Why did this verse ought to just magically appear? Well, there seemed to be a gentleman, of the, uh, a, a, a Pharisee, who had come to Jesus, and he was asking questions. Good master, good teacher. You know, how do, I, how do we inherit the kingdom? And he gave him some, he gave him answers, you must be born again. Now, that just freaked the guy out. He says, how can I enter my mother's womb again? And he just shook his head and he said, you're a master of the Pharisees. And he started talking about spirit. And he started talking about, he started talking about the difference between the spirit and the physical. And as the conversation went on, this is the verse that he uses to, to finish the conversation. It is the reason we have Christmas. It is the reason that we celebrate a little baby being born, born some 2,000 years ago. It is for this reason that He came, that He sent His Son. He was wanting to know how to be born into God's family. And there's no clearer verse to know that than John 3.16. Let me ask you a question though. See, there it is. Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> what if that verse isn't true? What if it's a lie? What if it's just made up? Maybe Jesus just made it up. Now look, I, I know I, I have been in church and in ministry, I've been in church all my life and in ministry half of it. I have to ask myself that question. What if what I'm doing is just not true? It's not heretical to say that, ask that. It's heretical to believe it. To test it. What if? What if? John 3, 16 isn't true. What if God had not loved the world? For God so loved the world. What if He didn't love the world? Without God's love, there would be no hope in this world at all. We like to pretend, we like to you know, go around saying the world peace and harmony and love and hope for the entire world. But let me tell you something, that's not the world. The world is full of bad things and bad things happen. Our world would be a dark planet hurling through space without hope. There would be nothing to live for and no purpose for existence. It would be a world where prayers were useless, 
uh, useless Christ in the sky, and every death would be the end of a personal hope, and every grave a place of despair. That's what life would be like if God did not had not loved this world. God looked down upon this world and saw that there was no hope. That people would be totally and forever lastingly separated from Him and there would be no hope for this world. And if He had to love us, He would have said they're not worth it. Now we've all got people in our lives families, maybe it's friends that have went off the path. That went off the deep end. And you want to throw up your hands and say I'm done with them. No more. I hope that there's enough love in our hearts that that's, you know, that we can not say that. That we can open our arms and do what we need to do to help them. But I want you to imagine what God went through with looking at us. How we rejected Him at every turn in our, in, and throughout history. And yet God loved us enough to provide a way to be with Him forever. Through His Son. I'm going to tell you something. I want to tell you this morning that God does love the world. He does. It is a true statement. You know, we can play the what if game all you want, but the fact is, God did love the world enough. Everything speaks of God's love to our to humanity. Every sunrise, every blade of grass, every fountain of water, every bird, the face of a newborn child, all speak in our evidence of the love of God. Look at the skies at night and you see the wonder and the magnificence of God and you see the love of God because of what He has given us to live here, to live in. But the greatest demonstration of God's love is the cross. Which makes me think of this. What if God had not given His Son? What if He says, forget about it. They have rejected me way too many times. And I know how. I know there's going to be more. I mean, even though I give them, not everybody's going to. Matter of fact, most people are going to reject Him. He knew that He would have to go to the cross and His Son would have to face the torment of God turned his back upon him because he took the sins of the world upon him. The verse goes on to say that he gave his only begotten son. What if instead of giving us his son, what if he decided to give us what we deserve? Do you ever want to get what you deserve? <laughs> Be careful. Be careful. I just want what I deserve. <laughs> Don't say that at your workplace, okay? You'll get you ironing my boy. <laughs> you want grace and mercy. You don't want to get what you deserve. And instead of sending us his son to die for our sins and giving us the opportunity to have a life on this earth worth living and giving us eternal life forever, what if he just sent us all to hell? What if he said, forget it. I ain't giving up my son for them, for them. It ain't worth it. You see, if God loved the world, but had not given his son, we would never be able to know and experience true love. God's love would be frustrating without the cross of Calvary. We wouldn't know what real love was. You see, real love always demands giving. A man marries, and then he gives himself for his wife and his children. Why does he go to work and provide for his family? Because love demands giving and sacrifice. Why does he spend time with his wife and children when there are a multitude of other things for him to do? Because he can talk about love with his lips, but unless there's giving, 
unless there is sacrifice, is just empty words. A woman marries and he gives of herself to her family. Why does she wash load after load of clothes and pick up the same dirty socks and underwear off the floor and make the same beds day in and day out? Because beating in her heart is a love for her husband and the family that manifests that love through sacrifice and giving. Why does she sit by the bedside of a child with a fever and lovingly wipe the child's forehead with a washcloth as she caresses him in her arms at 2 o'clock in the morning? I've seen that. I don't understand it. The reason is because she will her because love always involves giving and sacrifice. And God showed his love for us by giving us his most treasured possession. Romans 5 8 says this that God demonstrated or commended his love towards us. How he showed his love toward, towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This book could be filled with the love, talking about God's love. But it wouldn't mean anything, really, unless he showed it. And God showed it. I sent him his son. He didn't have to. He could have just kept telling us that he loved us. He could, but he showed us. I thank God. I praise God that he decided to send his son, showing us what true love truly is. Praise God that he did send his son to the cross for us. God has given his son, and apart from this, there is no salvation. Without sending his son, there would be no eternal life. There would be no hope in this world. This life would be a meaningless, meaningless existence. The hedonists, the, the, the people who are all about this world, say that the chief end in life is pleasure. If that's the case, if Christ did not send His Son, then that's the only thing worth about this life is trying to find the biggest pleasure in the world before you die. And it all ends. You know, we should eat, drink, and be merry. Because after the grave, there's nothing. But there is. Because this verse is true. For God so loved the world that He gave His Son. All that would be true. All that would be true sent his son to die for our sins. But he did sin. What if God's offer of salvation was not for the whosoevers? What does that mean? <laughs> what if God's offer of salvation was not for the whosoevers? That whosoever believeth in Him. Whosoever. Now, the wonderful word, whosoever, it is a comforting word. It embraces all of humanity, yet it touches each and every one of us. It means the gospel is for everyone. Which means it's for you, and it means it's for me. So, do you see it? Whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I want you to think about something for me for a moment. Suppose God had offered salvation only to the rich. I ain't making it. <laughs> People like you and me probably wouldn't make it. All you folks who are broke days before paycheck, or payday, too bad. If it was just for the rich. Suppose God had offered salvation to the healthy or the fit. I'm going to have to go on that exercise program. I don't know if I can make it or not. 
<coughs> just for the healthy or the rich or the fit. Some of us probably wouldn't even have a chance. Suppose God had offered salvation only to the educated. Some would never make it happen because uh, maybe not had the same opportunities as others. And I, you know, I'm pretty ignorant about some stuff. I, besides that, I'm not even sure what I'd be wanting. To, you know, what the qualifications? <coughs> what, what, I, what would I need to know? How smart do I need to be? How educated? So. I, I, at this point, I'm not fitting in at all. I don't know, you make your own gauge, but I ain't fitting in at all. What if salvation was only offered to the good and only offered to the righteous and the pious people? Only to the good people. I'm going to tell you something that may offend you. If it does, then we probably need to talk. None of us would be able to have the hope of ever seeing Jesus because the Bible says that there is none good without one. I certainly don't fit that qualification. But whosoever was right, transferred him, translated pious or righteous. What if so who can be saved? If, if it's not, you know, if it's not narrowed down, who is it? Who so ever? And you might somebody might say, but you know what, I care no way I can get to heaven because you don't know my sin, you don't know my past, you don't know my history, you don't know how bad a person I am. And so that cannot be me. I don't know your past. But God does. <laughs> and He knew it 2,000 years ago which He gave this wonderful promise. Remember Romans 5, 8? But God commended His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't save us after we get rid of our sin. <laughs> it's not like that at all. It is whosoever. No matter where you're at, what position you are in life, no matter how many sins you may have committed in your past, whosoever is you and you and me. God doesn't save us just once we clean up our lives to be good. He doesn't save us after we made ourselves holy or religious. He just the opposite. He saves us when we're in our sin, just as uh, just as we are. And then He saves us from our sin, and He makes us what we ought to be. You can't get a better deal than that. How precious it is to know that it's whosoever. That's it. <coughs> When you're driving down the road and you see these poor people in those three corners, these homeless people, these people with drug addicts, people who are who come upon bad times in life, people who've done some really bad things. They're the whosoever also. So are you here this morning with a burden of sin? John 3 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only God the Son who served the Are you loaded down with cares and problems from the mess you've made up in your life? i got some good news for you. John 3, 16. Whoever, whosoever you are, if you're without Jesus as your Savior, come to Jesus today because it's for you, no matter who or what you've done. Now, last part I want to look at this morning in this verse. What if God's offer of salvation was not based on faith alone. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'd like to picture with me three very, you, uh, three very common scenarios today. I want you to picture with me all of those who are trying to get God through good works today. 
They're trying to work the way to heaven, literally. There's a lot of folks doing that, are trying to do that. People, these people are sincere, they're working, they're trying, and they're dying. And even though Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. This is the, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. They just keep still trying. That's the picture we would have if this verse, if John 3, 16 is not correct. I want you to picture people everywhere trying to earn salvation by obeying God's law. We've had some talks of times about God's law. And it's all an effort to please God, to make themselves a little more worthy of God. God uh, uh, hoping to get good, you know, in good with God by their goodness and their righteous living. And this is in spite of the fact that God said, what God said about the goodness and good life. In Isaiah 64, 6, He says, but we are all as an unclean thing and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind is taking us away. We can't do enough good things. We can't be good enough. We're as dirty rags, even when our best. I wanted you to look at a picture in a vain effort to get people to heaven through religion. When you trust in a certain church or denomination, or a faith group, or trusting in certain religious rites like baptism, or confession, or communion. You put your faith in your it to get you saved, to get you right with God. Titus 3 5 says, No, not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. No, that's not it either. But I want to show you another picture. Final, a, a final scenario, and it may surprise you. There, were, there was a dying thief on one of the three crosses in Calvary. And on the cross in the middle was Jesus Christ. He was the sinless Lamb of God dying for the sins of everyone, and uh, including the two thieves that were there with Jesus. One on each side of him. One of them mocked him. The other said to Jesus in faith, Lord, remember me when thou comest, when thou comest into thy kingdom. Now hold on a second. That ain't right. That ain't right. How dare him say such a thing? Why? He, because, why? Because he had lived his whole life in sin. He was a thief. He was on a cross getting killed for his sins. And Jesus was on the cross unjustly who had never sinned. He was there. <laughs> he was there because he was rejected. And he gave himself for that. But this thief, this thief was a sinner. A man of dishonesty. He was a man of fraud. He was a man of deception and vice. And it's doubtful that he ever lived a good life. That he had ever tried to obey the commandments of God. That he had, or do good deeds for the poor. He probably never did that. He had never taken communion. He had never been baptized. He had never been confirmed. <clears throat> and I doubt if he'd ever tied or did any, any other religious act. He was, just not, he was just no good person. How dare he, such as one as he approached the Son, the Holy Son of God, and asked him to remember him when he got to heaven. You know, you know the answer, don't you? You know us. You know what he told you. But Jesus looked at him and said, "Verily or truly, I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise." The dying thief was given the promise of eternal life with Jesus on the basis of one thing, and that is faith in Jesus Christ, who paid the sin penalty for him. He took his place. That's the gospel. Can you imagine if John 3.16 was not true? We'd be without hope. 
Do we even have a society if man just did whatever they wanted to do and there was no hope in life? My question for you is this. Have you put your faith wholly in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you made that decision to give Him your heart and your life? Are you try, or are you trying to clean up your life first? Just trust Jesus to save you from your sin. Aren't you glad that John 3.16 is true? It was, it's worth memorizing that as a kid. You see, God did love the world. And that means God loves you. And if you were the only person on earth, God would have sent Jesus to die just for you. That's how much He loves you. God did send His Son to die for your sins. The blood He shed on the cross is the only thing that can save you from your sins. Jesus was your substitute who paid the penalty for that sin that you deserve to pay. God's salvation is for whosoever. And that means anybody. Not just church-going people. Not just for good people. Not for rich people. Not just for poor people. But for everyone. Who so ever. You see, in sinners like Nicodemus, it was for him too. Who supposedly already had the answers to God and to salvation. But he didn't. And God's offer of salvation is by grace through faith alone. Alone. Not your church, not your religion, not your works, not how much penance you've done, not how many offerings you paid, not how many Hail Marys you've said or Masses you've taken or how many times you've been baptized or you or confirmed. See why this verse is important? It sums up the whole purpose of why God sent His Son to this earth to begin with. Without all of this, we would have no hope. I want you to remember a time in your life when you felt like you had no hope in life. Can you remember a time in your life where you, where you kind of hear the walls seem to be closing around and uh, around you, and there just seemed to be no hope? I want you to imagine living your entire life without the prospects of eternal life. I want you, and I know it's hard for us who've been in church and who have accepted Christ for so long and we have this kind of a peace that knows that when our day, our, our day comes that we're going to pass it from this life, that we'll be with Him. There's a comfort there. But I want you to imagine not having that peace. Not having that comfort. I want you to imagine going through Christmas just giving gifts and, and thinking about the secular things of Christmas without ever once thinking about John 3.16 and the reason why He came in the first place. There will be a time when I will celebrate my last Christmas. There will be a time when I will get my last gift. There will be a time, well, when I preach my last sermon. There will be a time when I'll draw my last breath. Because of John 3.16 and my belief in, the, in the, birth, the birth of this baby boy who grew up to die for my, my sins in my place. Because of that, I have a hope. I know that when I draw my last breath that I'm going to where I'll be and what I'll be doing. All this other stuff in the big picture, really doesn't matter. Can you imagine living a life without John 3.16? Can you imagine living your life going through one Christmas after another, going through one day after another, knowing that the end is coming and you haven't a clue about what's at, it, at the end of it? But John 3.16 gives me that hope. If you're here today and you have no hope, what you're saying is, I don't believe John 3.16. I don't believe it's true. 
Would you re-look at the verse again? Would you reread it over and over again? Because it gives you hope. For whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It is truly the reason for this season and every season. This morning, if you're here and you have no hope, maybe it's because you don't believe that John 3.16 is really true. So as we stand in prayer of an invitation, I don't know your heart, I don't know your life, but I know that God does. He knows those who are His. He knows those who have he knows those who have accepted him and born into his family, born again. He knows those who are consistently rejecting him. He knows the ones who are pretending. He knows the ones that are out and out rejecting. And here, right now, he is asking you to believe that John 3.16 is true. And if you leave here today and you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart and your life, and you believe here today and you don't do that, you don't ask Him into your heart. You don't trust and believe in Him. Then you're just saying, I don't believe what God's Word has said. So the question is not just merely hypothetical. What if? There are people who are making John 3.16 decisions about John 3.16 every time they hear the Gospel and reject it. They say, I don't believe it's true. How else would you look at it? So this morning, if you're here and you've never asked Christ in your heart, you've never put your trust in the hope and turned away from this world and believed in Him, and He's come into your heart and life and changed you and made you a child of God, being born again, if that's never happened to you, then I'm asking you, pleading with you, would you believe the words of John 3, 16, that it applies to you? Child of God, you're here. If you're here today and you're the same child of God, which I, I hope you are, if you're here today and, and you're a child of God, I mean, can I, can, there are some world of people out there who have no hope. A simple verse, and so powerful and impacting, you say, well, how can I reach people? John 3, 16. And then show it in your life. We have a world to reach. And he's given us the perfect weapons in order to reach it. So as we sing this morning, would you come and make decisions that the God that God's laying on your heart today?